All right. Well, I know that you want to get into some scripture as we wait, Brother Ed, to join us. So I'm going to turn it over to you and let you do your thing by the grace of God. All right. Thanks. Um, you know, we're talking tonight. We're going to be addressing Joshua Chavez from the uh, YouTube channel Service Christy. And he, like Dean Odell and Leighton Flowers and Mike Winger that we've discussed, all preach a works-based salvation. And they'll often take scripture out of context and they'll isolate it and not compare it to other scriptures to see exactly what it means. They're not being Bereans. Um, they're going in and being wolves, going in there and di dissecting the scriptures how they want them. But uh, as you did your video, and I recommend anyone out there listening, uh, Brother Carl's done a couple great videos on uh, exposing Service Christi, Joshua Chavez, and he's done a couple of great videos uh, in the past week or so exposing Nathan Roberts from Flat Earth Doctrine and uh, Dean Odell. I'd recommend you guys going to his channel and checking those out. But um, one scripture that uh, Joshua Chavez used in his video clip that uh, Brother Carl played, I know Brother Carl did a great job of exposing this, but for those listening now, I'm going to read out of Matthew chapter 7. As always, I'll be reading out of the Authorized King James Bible. And starting in verse 13, it says, Enter ye in the straight gate, for, the wide is, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth uh, not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man who has built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Many will just leave that passage at that, and they'll turn it into works. But I want to jump over here and just read a short passage out of John 10, and I want to make a point of showing who the people are who will hear the word, the words of Jesus Christ and do them, who will have their house built on the solid ground. John chapter 10, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. And um, you can go through, and I encourage you to read through the entire book of John. I don't, I don't want it to be like Dean Odell saying, just go and read 6. He tells you to read 6, 10, 17, doesn't tell you to read John 8. Read the whole book. But I encourage you to go read uh, John chapter 10, read the whole chapter, and see here, that this, when you read the scripture in context, context it goes together. We are told to do these, that we will do these things to enter the kingdom of heaven. And that uh, if we will uh, hear the sayings of the Lord and do them, we are likened to a wise man who built his house upon a rock. That's all true. But who are the ones who are going to hear the voice of the Lord and do these things? And it is the sheep. And we know the Lord's voice and we follow after him and we will not follow another. It's not our works. It's the work of the Lord. And I just wanted to open with that and show that we just can't take something and say, oh, look, it says to do this, but how do we do this? How does it happen? It's the work of the Lord by his grace. You can go ahead, Brother Carl. Yes, and, you know, in Matthew 7 here, I love the plain teaching here. It's a very plain doctrine. You know, when he says in verses 13 and 14, when, when our blessed Redeemer says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for who is for wide is the gate? And broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto eternal life, and few there be that find it. And by the time we get down to verse 22, all right, 
verse 21 and 22, we see plainly what the wide road is that leads to destruction. And it's works. This is very plain doctrine. He says in verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. So we see here on the day of judgment, these people are still fleeing to the works of their hands. They're still fleeing to it because they are not Christ's sheep. All right, now. In this article that we're going to be discussing tonight, Can We Lose Salvation as Christians? It's an article by Service Christie, published on July 5th of this year. Um, he goes on to say that faith is not a work. Well, I believe that Scripture teaches that the false decisionism, which we're calling out and speaking of, that you can attempt to make Christ your personal Lord and Savior is indeed a work. I believe this is plain doctrine taught in Christ. And if an, in, and if an individual believes that Christ just made salvation possible for them but didn't save them from their sin and requires faith from them, a creature that is dead in trespasses and sins, to make his blood effectual on their behalf, I hate to tell Mr. Chavez here, all right, but that's the greatest work. There is no work greater than making the blood of Christ effectual on your behalf. Would you agree? Yeah, completely. And as well, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, you can. Um, you know, I was just going to say real quickly, like I did in my video this morning, and like you talk about, and, you know, we all talk about quite often here on the Grace of God podcast. Okay, the ones, the individuals here being spoken of that Christ tells that he never knew them, to depart from me, you that work iniquity, I never knew you. This is because these were not given to him. He did not know these people from before the foundation of the world. These were not the ones that he received in the divine covenant from the Father that are regenerated by the Holy Spirit of God, calling them to faith in Jesus Christ. All right, this is a clear, this is clear doctrine taught to us in Scripture, and we see this in John 10, where you were just reading from. Um, if we just go, if we go over to, to verse 14 of John 10, we see here, I'm the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father and lay down my life for the sheep. All right, in verse 20, in verse 26, we see, in verse 25, we say, we see here that the Jews have come to him and asked Christ, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. All right, how long dost thou make us to doubt? Verse, 20, verse 24, if thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them and told you. Jesus answered them, I told you and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. This is what people do, like Mr. Chavez, when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Like Chavez is doing in this article, he's picking up stones to stone Christ, all right? And Christ came into this world to save his people from their sins. That's what he did. This is the individuals that he knows is, was the ones given to him by the Father. And we, despite what these devils like Chavez say, can never perish all, every single one of us that Christ gave his life for and put away our sin. Every single one of these individuals must go free. Yeah, and I think one important thing that people, you know, who are doing this, you you got two different lenses you can read the Bible through. You can read the lens through the through the lens of God or from man's point of view. And we must always read it from God's point of view. You know, anyone who'd want to take they want to take these verses that appear to be about man working to do anything, they're not reading them through the lens that of you know of these of these passages of John six, John chapter ten, um, the entire New New Testament of where God has chosen his people in Christ before the foundation of the world. We are preordained to do good deeds and work and walk in them. 
But we're also taught that there will be many who fall away because they have made like Josh Chavez and people like him want to make. They make false professions of faith because they're coming from the point of view of man that they can go, as you said, make Jesus Lord of their lives. And when we're we're reading those scriptures, we need to read them through the lens of that God is the creator of all things. There's nothing that, that comes about that he has not made and decreed. And then we're not looking at it from our point of view. If you start with looking at it from man's point of view, you can never get to God. But when, you, when, you're being, when you're given grace and shown that it's all about God and his plan, his perfect plan that's, that is playing out and it's already done, it's a finished work, then when you read these verses about doing works, you can say, oh, as a Christian, saved by the grace of God, I'm supposed to do these things, and I can by the grace of God. It's not about losing your salvation as these people want to make it. Those people who fall away do so because they've made false professions, because they're will-worshipping idolaters who think it's all about themselves. And they're looking at everything through the lens of the so-called human free will, and they don't see it that, oh, I'm dead in sins and trespasses. Uh, therefore, you know, as like you said this morning, you know, reading out of Genesis chapter 1, going back to that, the day Adam and Eve died. And spiritually, they had died spiritually as soon as Adam ate that fruit. And these people still want to look at it through the satanic, satanic lens of that it's all about them. And I want to tell you, folks, you can't read the Bible from a perspective of yourself. You have to start with the creator, God. All things come from him, by him, for him, through him. And if you start with the lens of looking at everything through human eyes, you can never get to God. That's just something I want to put out there. Amen. And great point. Thank you for that, Brother Aaron. And as well, the minute that you take faith out of the hands of God where it belongs, all right, like we're told in, in Ephesians 2, for by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The minute that you put your hands to it and declare that that faith didn't come from God, that it's not the gift of God, and it's not the faith of Christ given to you at the new birth, all right, and you make it, you make it originating with you by your so-called free will's decision to make Christ your personal Lord and Savior, you have turned faith into a work because you have laid your filthy hands on it. Now, despite what these devils, all right, like Chavez says in this article here about faith not being a work, because he has laid his hands to it and attempted to take it from God where it belongs, and make it his by laying his filthy hands on him. He has defiled it, and he's made it a work. Amen. And as you stated before, it's like will worship is it's the one world religion. It's do what, you know, as Aleister Crowley's book say, do what thou wilt. It's all about what I can do. And it's not anything about what God has already done. It's demonic. It's, it's pure and simple. It's, it's the satanic anti-gospel, you know, his brother Ed's book, the anti-gospel. I recommend anyone reading that book. That it's the doctrine of the antichrist. It's the doctrine of Rome. It's all about man's works and man somehow, and we know the Pope and the, and the Catholic Church aren't really trying to get anyone saved in any way. It's all false doctrine to lead people to hell because it's the antichrist. But I truly believe that will worship is the one world religion. Indeed. And there is Brother Ed Henry. Brother Ed, how are you? I am well, thank you. How are you? Doing well by the grace of God. Good. Good evening, sir. How are you, Aaron? I'm great. Thank you. Good. All right. Well, glad to be with you guys in fellowship. And I know my lovely wife is listening. And I'd like to say hello to her. And I love you. And Brother Aaron and Brother Ed, um, like I say, I'm glad to be in fellowship with you guys tonight. And, and Brother Ed, I'm just going to – what I'm going to do from this point on, from this point on in the broadcast is just sort of defer to you a little bit tonight. Um, well, I know that I do that a lot, but I'm just going to turn the broadcast over to you and let you um, talk about this subject. I know that you've had some exchanges with Service Christi, Mr. Joshua Chavez, and I would just like for you to speak on that and just – Take it from here, Brother Ed. Okay. Well, this this issue with Service Christi, um, Joshua Chavez, uh, has to do with um, his position that a person can lose their salvation. In fact, I'm I'm just refreshing the page where 
<clears throat> I had put a comment on recently uh, that he has uh, not approved. So he's the moderator of his site, and he hasn't approved my comment. And basically, uh, my comment was this, and I'll paraphrase it. I, I don't want to – well, let's see. Maybe, maybe it'll read okay. I, I told uh, Joshua Chavez on his uh, website, Service Christie, and I think his website is beginningofsorrows.org. <clears throat> and um, he just hasn't commented. He hasn't posted the comment. I put it on up on September 29th. So it's been about, uh, what, five days now. Uh, no, maybe, yeah, five days. So I said here, I said to him, you stated that unconditional salvation – otherwise known as uh, perseverance of the saints, is a potentially devastating belief. He literally said that. Uh, you double down and claim that while God's desire for us is to be in, in intimate fellowship and communion with him, that reality is conditional. So he says the reality that of God's desire to be in intimate fellowship is conditional. Okay, well, that's interesting. <clears throat> I told him that that theology requires Jesus Christ to leave the salvation of any given person up to the free will decision of that person. Uh, to be consistent, then, you must agree that Jesus Christ must necessarily have died for the sins of everyone in the world in order for all to have the chance by their free will to believe in him unto salvation. If one can then fall into unbelief by the exercise of his will and lose his salvation, he will be punished in hell for his sins. And I told him, I said, that theology of yours is directly contrary to the gospel. I said, as you know, one must be perfectly righteous to enter heaven. And I cited for him Matthew 5.48. Uh, and 12.36, and James 2.10. And I, um, so I, I'll, I won't stop and quote those. The, the problem with his website is that when you hover over those links, he has quotes from the New King James. So it's of questionable authority when you, when you want to quickly give, give a quote from those passages, he uses the New King James. And I've talked to him about that before, and he dodges that issue. He won't address it. He dodges it completely uh, using a new Bible version. <clears throat> so anyway, I said the gospel is unequivocally clear that no one is righteous and no one seeks after God. And I cited to him uh, Romans 3, 10 through 11. And so, in fact, let me turn to that, and we can... We can see that it says in Romans 10, 3, through 11, 10, uh, 3, 10 through 11, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Okay. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. So <clears throat> nobody seeks after God. The, this idea of the Arminians that somehow... Uh, man can seek after God is refuted by what the Bible says. None seek after God. God has to go searching for them. He is the good shepherd who searches and finds his lost sheep. His lost sheep, are they, they, can, they don't search for him. He goes out and gets them, okay? And I've made the point that man is spiritually dead and must be born again by the power of God in order to believe in Jesus. And we have for our authority there, John 3, 3 through 8. And so let's look at John 3, 3 through 8. Um, if you turn to it, you'll see that it says, give me a moment here. Okay, John 3, 3 through 8. It says, um, Jesus answereth and say unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I, say, uh, the, that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the wind, uh, the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh and whither it goes, goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now, that's a very important point that the free will Arminians seem to overlook. Jesus is making the point that being born again is completely of the Holy Spirit. And it is completely based on the will of God. He says, and he equates being born again, okay, uh, to the wind. He said, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou heareth the wind thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh. So you don't know where it's coming from, okay, um, and where it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. So you don't have control over the wind, nor do you have control over whether you're born again. It comes from something from outside of you, like as the wind, okay? Uh, you don't control the wind, and so you don't control whether you're born again. The idea that your faith somehow gives rise to being born again is... Uh, is contrary to what the Bible says. You Being born again comes from outside of the person, okay? And so, um, so we look at uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 6, and that further explains that concept. So if you look at Ephesians, let's turn to Ephesians, okay? Uh, chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 6, <clears throat> it says, and you hath he quickened. Okay, who quickened you? God did. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. So a man who is dead in trespasses and sins, which is the condition in which we're born, okay, cannot quicken himself, cannot be born again, cannot birth himself, okay? So God must do it. He quickens, he quickens the person. Okay, the person who is dead in trespasses and sin, he gives that person life. Where and in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom uh, also we had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the uh, mind, and were by nature children of the of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, okay, so it's God's mercy. God is rich in mercy, and he is he shows his mercy, okay, uh, for his great love wherewith he loved us. So he loves us. He's going to show his great mercy to us. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us. So it's God who quickens us. It's God who rebirths us. It's God who quickens us together with Christ. And it says, by grace ye are saved. So it's clear that this grace by which we are saved is a quickening by God who quickens us. He does that. We are dead in trespasses and sins, and that makes it clear. And it, in verse 6, it says, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So here we have a clear picture that to be born again is by God. We have no power over it, okay? It is all of Jesus Christ. So, I made the point that God imbues his elect with the faith needed to believe in Jesus. 
So the Arminians say this born again, being born again, is because we believe in God, because we believe in Jesus. No, you believe in Jesus because you've been born again. That is the fruit, that is the gift of God. And that point, that point is made in uh, Ephesians, okay, uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 8. We look at, it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourself, okay? It is a gift of God. We see that also in Romans 3.21 through 26. So if you turn to Romans and you go to chapter 3, uh, verses 21 through 26, you'll see uh, that it says, but now the righteousness of God, uh, which the law manifested being witnesses by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faith of Jesus Christ. So it's of Jesus Christ. It's the faith of Jesus Christ. And of course, all of the Bible versions, the new Bible versions, other than King James, change that word of to in. Okay, But it's clear, it's the faith of Jesus Christ, and he gives us that faith. That is part of what is being born again. When you're reborn, you are infused. You are given the faith of Jesus Christ. It is a gift of God, as Ephesians 2.8 makes clear. Unto all and upon all them that believe. So all them that believe have the faith of Jesus Christ. For it, there is no difference. For all have shin and sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay. So all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, being justified freely by his grace. Okay. So we're justified by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ whom Jesus has set forth to be a propitiation through faith. So he's a propitiation for our sin. That is, he satisfies God Almighty, the justice that's required by God Almighty for sin. He satisfies that need by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Uh, when God set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare the righteousness by the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So our belief in Jesus, okay, brings about the propitiation of our sins by Jesus Christ on the cross. He pays the penalty for our sin. God Almighty is satisfied by that sacrifice and we are then given the, re the righteousness of Jesus Christ, all right? There is a legal exchange here. So we are given faith from Jesus Christ. Faith is a gift of God. Now, I made the point to Joshua in my, uh, my attempted post, which he apparently has decided not to post. Uh, I'm guessing because he had no response, no adequate response to this. And I said, in order to enter heaven, one must have their sins atoned. And I told him that his false universal atonement model, where Jesus Christ is on the cross and he atones for the sins of the whole world, is based on a claim that Jesus atoned for all sins of every person in the world ever, okay? And that's required under his theology. So under his theology, if all people have the, uh, the, uh, uh, the chance, okay, to believe in Jesus, if all people have the ability to believe in Jesus, that means that all sins must have been atoned by Jesus on the cross, okay? Because in order to exercise your free will to accept what they claim is the free gift of God to accept it, he's holding it out, you've got to accept it, that free gift must be there. It has to be there. It's required to be there. 
their theology, it makes it necessary that Jesus Christ have atoned for all the sins of everybody in the world in order for there to be a possibility for all to believe in Jesus, okay, by the exercise of their free will, okay? So if that's the case, okay, if a person has had the, the possibility to be saved by the exercise of his free will, Jesus must have atoned for those sins, okay? So I told him that the falling away to perdition for a Christian is impossible because he claims that a person can believe and then later fall into unbelief and lose their salvation, okay? And I said, that's not possible. I said, that's because Jesus' atonement is a substitutionary atonement. That is, his atonement on the cross substitutes for us. So he atones for our sins. And in that capacity, he takes on, he takes on our sins and we take on his righteousness. There's a legal exchange on the cross. And, and we see that concept. Okay, let's let's look through some passages. I, I, I told him to look at Hebrews 9 26, 10, 12. Ephesians 5, 2, and Romans 4, 25. And I said this legal exchange is explained in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21, and Romans 4, 21 through 25, okay? And Christians are justified. That is made righteous by faith in Jesus Christ, okay? We are justified by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you turn to Romans chapter 4, uh, verses four through eight, that point is made. So it says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So the point is that we are saved by God's grace. We can't work for it, okay? But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, this faith is counted for righteousness. So Jesus Christ justifies the ungodly. How does he do it? Okay, by faith. And that faith is counted for righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. So we are blessed by God by the righteousness of Jesus Christ, by faith in Jesus Christ, okay? And we see this concept again in James 2.23. And we turn to James. I always have a hard time finding James. Um, there we go. James uh, 2.23, it says, And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him, for righteousness. So here we have the imputation of righteousness, okay, uh, by faith. So righteousness is imputed by faith, and he was called the friend of God. So there is a legal exchange where by our belief, Jesus, the, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, and the, our sins are then imputed to Jesus Christ. Okay, he takes our sins, we take his righteousness. Now, here's the problem. If all the sins for which Jesus was a propitiation on the cross are remitted, then he can only have died on the cross for the sins of his elect who will be saved. If, as claimed by Joshua, uh, that all sins in the world were atoned for by Jesus Christ on the cross, that means that all sins in the world have to have been remitted on the cross by Jesus Christ. That every sin of every person in the world would have been atoned for in order for there to be a possibility of every person in the world to believe of their own free will in Jesus Christ and then take on his righteousness. Well, here's the problem. We know, the Bible makes it clear, okay, that most of the world is sent to hell for their sins. And we see that in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. So let's look at that. So we got to have authority for everything we say. 
So let's look at Matthew 7, 13 through 14. And what does it say? It says, enter ye into the, at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in there it. So um, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So wide is the gate that leads to destruction. So basically under his theology, Jesus Christ atoned for the sins of the whole world, and most of those people in the world are sent to hell for sins for which Jesus has already atoned. Well, that's punishing sins twice. That can't be right. How can Jesus have paid the penalty for a sin? That makes his penalty that he paid on the cross ineffectual. Well, that can't be. That means that there are people in hell who have the righteousness of Christ, because as you know, on the cross, there was a legal exchange where he takes on our sins, we take on his righteousness. If he died for the sins of the whole world, that means there's righteous people in hell burning for the sins for which Jesus atoned. That, that is not correct. That, that violates uh, the gospel, okay? So, uh, so I said that his false theology of universal atonement has a lying God that goes back on his promises to forget the sins for which Jesus has atoned, okay? Indeed, his universal atonement has a God with a small g enforcing eternal punishment in hell on those who have been imputed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. His God, his false God, unjustly punishes the same sin twice, once on the cross, and again in hell. The problem with that is the scriptures say, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no offering for sin, Hebrews 10, 17, and 18. So once Jesus Christ paid the penalty for sin, then he's going to remember those sins no more. They've been remitted. There's no more offering for sin, no more punishment for sin. He will remember those iniquities no more. But according to, to uh, um, the uh, Joshua's uh, theology, oh, yes, he will. Oh, yes, he will. And that, that's not right. Uh, back to you guys. I mean, that was excellent, Brother Ed. Yes, um, he has not posted your comment. I've been checking it periodically, and indeed, he has not posted it. Um, <laughs> Brother Aaron, I'll let you comment, and then I will make a comment, and then I'll get Brother Ed, if he doesn't mind, to address the 11th chapter of Romans, verse 22, because this is the verse that he has out of context and pasted on this article, Can a Christian Lose Their Salvation? So go ahead, Brother Aaron. You know, one thing that we come across um, with all these people who are teaching free will salvation, that you can lose your salvation, is that Number one, they don't understand grace. They don't understand, you know, justification, as you just explained very well, Brother Ed. Um, but they also leave out the part in all the scriptures that talk about all the false Christians who come along and pretend to be Christians for a while and fall away, but they're not actually saved. Now, I want to go over here to 1 John chapter 2 and just read a few verses here. I'm going to start in uh, verse 18, and it says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us, but they went out, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. So we see a clear picture here that there are those who have, give all appearances of being Christians. They're going along with the crowd. They're doing all these things. They're, they're wanting to partake of the things going around the Holy Spirit as we read in uh, Hebrews chapter 6 but they are not of us because it's clear here that these people they were not of us verse 19 for if they had been of us they would have no doubt continued when, with us but they went out that it might be made manifest they were not all of us so we need to see that separation of in scripture between the tares and the wheat those tares are mixed right in with the wheat it looks like they're one of the, the believers but they go out and their, their works and their deeds are manifested to show that they were not born of Christ. And if we skip over to verse 29 here in 1 John chapter 2, if you know that he is righteous, 
ye know that every one that doeth righteousness is born of him. So the righteousness here is coming from Christ and being born of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not ourselves. It doesn't come from us. There's a clear separation here in Scripture of those who pretend to be Christians and who aren't truly Christians, and here it says they're antichrist. They pretended to be one of us, but we found out they were not. It doesn't say that they were us and then they lost it. It says they were not of us. So you guys can go ahead. Yeah, Amen, and, and the interesting thing is these these uh, free will Arminians, okay, and again, they're called Arminians, not Armenians, okay. There are a lot of people who confuse that we're talking about the nationality of people from Ar 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 Armenia. No, we're, we're talking about Jacobus Arminius, okay, those people who are followers of Jacobus Arminius. They're called Arminians. Uh, this theology, which comes from Rome, all right, uh, they preach against the grace of God. It's not just that, you know, they they have their theology and they mind their business. No, they attack the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of Jesus Christ. I mean, people come out with books like Dean Odell comes out with a book called Grace Abuse, where his, at, at every page, he attacks the grace of God. Uh, Joshua Chavez has this article saying that you can lose your salvation. Um, his theology is is twisted. It's not true. Okay, there is passage after passage which makes clear that we are chosen before the foundation of the world. How can you lose your salvation if you were chosen before the foundation of the world? It's and the, the entire theme of the Bible is God's sovereign grace from the beginning to the end. It is the Amen. theme of the Bible, and they cherry-pick passages out of context and then twist them, and they love the new Bible versions because they can just avoid all of the inconvenient passages which refute their theology. Uh, back to you. Amen. Yeah, and I want to address a couple of paragraphs in his article really quickly. In this article, Can a Christian Lose Their Salvation?, um, if you go down about a quarter of the way, there's a section and it says losing salvation is a false works based gospel question mark. Now I'm going to read these paragraphs and then I'm going to address it and turn it back over. And then I'm going to turn it back over to you guys. It says, let's examine this logic for a moment. Losing salvation is a false works based gospel question mark. Let's examine this logic for a moment. First, let us note that this is not a biblical objection, but an anecdotal objection. It is merely philosophical not theological, might I add, it is poor philosophy as well. The premises for this argument would be formally framed as such. Premise one, salvation is a gift from God, not by works of man. Premise two, since it is not by my own works, it never depended on my obedience. Premise three, if I can lose a gift and it depends on my obedience, which is a work, and it was never truly a gift. Therefore, conclusion, therefore, if salvation can be lost, then it constitutes a works-based gospel. This sounds compelling at first glance, and it must, or it appeals to emotion and mere human reason without biblical guidance in order for a deductive argument to have a sound conclusion. The premises must be true and airtight. In the case before us, premise three is the weakest, whereby the entire tower comes crashing down. Though premise two also presents a half-truth, I have done my best not to erect a straw man argument here, but indeed he has, but to accurately present the argument as fairly as I have heard it presented. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us that it is by grace through faith and not works that we have been saved, that salvation is a gift from God. The, books of, the book of Romans belabors that it is faith and not works that God is pleased with, it, and it, it has only ever been faith that has accessed the blood of Jesus by his grace and mercy. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law, Romans 3, 28. We read in Romans 5, 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is, of course, contrasting the works of the law and showing that Abraham was justified by faith. This is an inward submission to and belief in God and not merely a ceremonial adherence. Paul reinforces that we have been justified freely by his grace. Romans 3.24, it is apparent then that works cannot save us, but that salvation is indeed a free gift that nobody is deserving of, and therefore all boasting is made void. So what about the argument? And this is the last paragraph I read. I have scarcely met someone who would call faith a work. And indeed, Faith is the very thing that is contrasted with works. We find faith juxta juxtaposed to works all throughout Paul's writing. So it is fair to conclude that if there is anything that is not a work, it is faith. Yet we know that 
without faith it is impossible to please God, Hebrews 11, 6. So although salvation is a gift through God, we are told that men are justified by their faith, so that faith must be present in an individual or they will never be justified before God. So what do we know about faith according to the Bible? Okay, this is how clever the devil is. And this is why I call people like this devil, because this dude's not ignorant. All right, he's doing this on purpose. All right, and what this is, this is a works-based doctrine. This is a works-based gospel. And what he's done is I've had people do this to me before, Armenians, all right? And they will look at you and tell you right in your face, my faith to make the blood of Christ effectual on my behalf is not a work. The faith that God has given me to exercise in my own so-called free will, all right, that God has given grace to everybody to exercise their own so-called free will to believe in Christ, and, the, and that they can exercise this faith which resides in them. All right, this is a work. There is no work greater than making the blood of Christ effectual on your behalf. All right, whenever you take, for the second that you take faith out of God's hands where it belongs, and put it in yours, you have made it a work, and you have defiled it. We're clearly told here in Ephesians 1, verse 4, according as he hath chosen us, verse 5, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. Verse 4, chapter 2, but God who was rich in mercy for, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, had quickened us together with grace, with Christ by grace you are saved. Verse 8, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a works lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So the minute that you take this faith out of God's hands and make it not a gift of God, the very faith of Christ, God giving you the God having grace upon you and saving you through the faith that He's given you and say that it has resided with you in some way. You have made it a work, and you have defiled it, and this is idolatry, and God will kill you for it. And that's what this individual is doing. I'll read one more verse and turn it back over to you guys. Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 14. I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it, and God doeth it that men should fear before him. Once again, the minute that you take faith out of God's hands, and say that it in some way resides with you. You have attempted to put your hands to the finished work of Christ. You've made faith the work. You've defiled it, and you're preaching an antichrist gospel. You know, I'm, if I'm, I can, I'm now, looking, through, I'm looking through his argument, and uh, he makes a very interesting statement. He said, where there is faith, there must be obedience. And where there is disobedience, faith is vacated. So he says then, Faith without faithfulness is not real faith. Works proving the validity of the faith, though men are not justified by the works themselves, but rather the faith producing them. And he's, he's really uh, trying to walk a tightrope because he's saying, listen, um, you have to do good works, and those good works must be done in order by you, okay, by you, by your will, by your own free will, those works must be done. And here's the problem. He's saying those works are manifestation of the faith, okay? Um, and he says, listen, the question must be, must be asked whether or not it is possible to lose faith. If it is possible to lose faith, then we are not talking about a work per se, but rather the seminal condition upon which salvation is established. Um, he's... What he's doing is very clever, and he's overlooking what God said in Ephesians chapter 2. So if we look at Ephesians chapter 2, the point is made that we are saved by grace through faith. It is not of ourselves, okay, and not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are the his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So all of the good works that we do are ordained ahead of time by God that we should walk in, in them. So he's missing the boat here. The boat is that our faith is a gift of God. 
that our faith Amen. is, as he says, manifested by our works, but those works are ordained by God that we should walk in them. He's suggesting that our faith comes from us and therefore our works come from us. Well, that is a very subtle, as uh, Carl has pointed out, a very subtle works salvation. So you have to keep working to make sure you have genuine faith. That work must come from your own free will, not preordained by Jesus Christ ahead of time, but by your will in the moment. Um, I'm sorry, but that's not, that's not what this says. This says just the opposite. Back to you. Yeah, and just real quick, Brother Aaron, and, and, and then I'll let you have it. And I just want to sit on this for one more minute. The minute that you come in here and take the faith that is not of ourselves, but the gift of God and say that it is not the gift of God, that it resides in each of us and we just have to exercise it, it becomes a work. It becomes a work. There is no other way around this. And when you put your hands to it, all right, and make it a work, you are going down the wide road that leadeth unto destruction. That's what that whole teaching is about. All right. And when you do that, you have defiled it. Anything we put our hands to, we defile. This is very, very subtle and very, very clever by this guy. Brother Aaron, I'll t- I will turn it over to you. Thank you for your patience, brother. I just want to quickly jump over here to Galatians uh, chapter 2, and verse 16. And it says, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, so we're seeing that our justification is from Christ, it's the faith of Christ, and our belief is the, is our justification is by the faith of Christ, not of ourselves. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I through the law am dead to the law that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we see right there that that's, that Christ specifically gave his life for him. Verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. And I do believe these people who think that righteousness is of their own works and their own faith, not the faith that comes from Christ, they are trying to make uh, Christ's death in vain, as it says here because they think they can do something to earn it and do something to keep it, but it's by the faith of Christ through his death. We are justified by his faith, not ours. And it's now Christ living in us. We didn't go on that cross and get crucified. Christ did. And we live by what he did and by his works. And um, these people are trying to make, you know, the righteousness of Christ in vain by saying that they must do something. They must do the works. They must have the faith themselves. They must do enough good deeds to keep it. And that is, to me, I think that is taking the righteousness of Christ and making him die in vain. As you guys have stated, if Christ died for sins that people are in hell for, then that was in vain. I think this clearly teaches against that. Go ahead. Oh, that's such a good point. That is such a good point. Um, what Now, what passage was that? I want to look at that again. Uh, it's Galatians chapter 2, uh, verses uh 16 through 21. Yeah. No, well, that's such a good point. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 if, listen, if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Yeah. I mean, um, if there's any righteousness that comes from man, and it seems that under Arminianism, there is righteousness that comes from man, is there not? That's what they say. In fact, I, I believe that all of their repentance is considered by their own free will, isn't it? Yep. You know, just as yep. just as their um, their faith is by their free will, 
so is their repentance. Um, and as you know, uh, all sin is when you fail to do good, knowing to do good, that's a sin. So a sin is not just doing something bad. It's actually failing to do something good. And under the Arminian view, uh, you have to be actually righteous. So you have to you have to do good. And if you don't do good, then that's a sin. And I don't know how they I mean, I know Dean Odell says, well, you got to uh, you can't you can't sin. I don't know how he works it out. I don't know. I mean. I don't know of anybody who's constantly doing every good thing they can possibly do. We fail all the time in that. In this flesh dwells no good thing. What what hope would they have? Well, Dean says Dean you got to confess your sins to him. Yeah, yeah, you have to confess your sins to him and his and his disgusting wife. <laughs> and of course, Dean Odell also says that if you commit a sin, that makes you demon possessed. He literally said that. <laughs> I'm not sure how Jesus paid for our sins, and you know, if we go confess our sins, that He's faithful and just to forgive them, that you know, you can now be taken over by Satan. But you know, that's, yeah. that's another point. Now, another <laughs> concept that that Joshua Chavez has is this idea that in in uh, John 15, if we turn to John 15, he's fascinated uh, by this. Um, this these this passage here, which is fine, okay, but but again, he takes it out of context and likes to twist it, so he doesn't read it properly. Okay, now Jesus says, "I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman." So far, so good. Now here's where Joshua gets a little twisted. He says, "Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away." And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. So he's suggesting that both of those branches are Christians. When in fact, that's not what it says. Uh, it, the branch that's in him that beareth not fruit is not a Christian. That's somebody who claims the title of Christian, claims to be in Christ, but it's not really in Christ. They're not bearing the fruit, okay? And so they're broken off. They're like dead branches. They're broken off and they're burned. And Jesus makes the point, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. So being in the vine is not the same as abiding in the vine. Those that abide in the vine, abide in the vine by the power of Jesus Christ not by their own will. He twists this around and suggests that the, the people that are, that are broken off are Christians that have fallen away, lost their salvation, and now are sent to hell. That's not what this means at all. Okay. Um, back to you. Yes, he's doing the that? same thing. Okay. Yes, he's, yeah, he's doing the same thing here. All right, on the heading of this article, he's doing the same thing here with Romans chapter 11, verse 22, where it says, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fail, severity but toward thee, goodness, thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. This is the same thing that Old does when, you know, with the passage that reads, um, If thou continue in my word, thou art my disciples indeed. This is the same teaching here that you just talked about, Brother Ed. And this is what Brother Aaron was saying earlier. All right, we, we continue in the faith because we abide in the vine. All right, and this is the work of God by his grace. And the evidence of us being the elect children of God is like, like Christ says there. Right, it is us continuing in his word. If you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. That's the that's the that's you know, that's the fruit of us being in him. It's us continuing in his word. And it's and I'll turn it over to you, brother Aaron. It's only these devils, all right, that are going to come in here and take the word out of context like this. And if we just keep reading here over to verse 19, it says in John 15, if you were of the world. The world would love his own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, 
therefore the world hateth you. Yes, I mean, this, this is the only way these people can support their demonic doctrines is to come into scripture and do the chubby checker with it. That's it. Well, I, I agree with you, and, and you, you've raised the issue of, of Romans 11. So what he has done is, again, again, I mean, these people take things out of context. So let's read the context of Romans 11. If you read Romans 11, verse 1, it says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid. For I also am an Israeli, Israelite, okay, um, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So what Paul is saying is that God has not cast away his people. And in verse 2, he makes the point, and this is the important point, um, because in other passages he makes the point that God has broken down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile. There is no distinction between Jew and Gentile any longer. And so Paul is explaining this concept in Romans chapter 11. Okay, so you have to understand what he's talking about. And he said, listen, God has not cast away his people. I'm a Jew. I'm an Israelite. I'm the seed of Abraham. I'm the tribe of, Abra uh, of Benjamin. He has not cast away his people. Who are his people? The very next verse he explains, God has not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Okay, what not that the scripture saith of Elias? How maketh intersection to God against Israel? Okay, and let's see. He's saying, um, uh, let's see. Lord, they have killed the prophets and dig down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God to him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. So what God is saying is, listen, it looks tough, okay? It looks like you're surrounded by enemies, and it looks like you're all alone. Not true. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed to the image, uh, their knee to the image of Baal, okay? So um, now in Romans 9, 6, it explains not as though the word of God hath taken uh, uh, none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. And so Paul's explaining this concept in Romans 11, but in Romans 9, he makes it explicitly clear. Neither, and this is Romans 9, verse 6, and now I'm going to talk about Romans 9, verse 7. Neither, because they are the seed of Abraham, are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Okay, so it's of God's elect, all right? So it's God's elect, all right? And it's they just because they're the physical seed of Abraham doesn't mean that they are the children. They must be of the promise of Abraham. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, okay? But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And that's the point that Joshua misses in Romans 11, and the point is that it's of God's grace by his promise, by his foreknowledge, okay, uh, before the foundation of the world, he has elected uh, a people according to grace, all right? And he did it progressively. He started with Israel, physical Israel, in order to illustrate the fruitlessness of man's free will, a conditional covenant that was based on their obedience it was a failure, and God knew it would be a failure, okay? And it was stuck in there so that we would know it's impossible to obey God's laws because the promise made to Abraham was that righteousness comes by faith, and that righteousness is imputed. It's not earned. And what did the Jews try to do? They tried to earn righteousness. So in verse 5 of uh, Romans 11, it says, Even so then, at this present time also there is a rem remnant according to the election of grace. So he's talking about the remnant of, uh, of Israel, okay, that's according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. So here, Romans 11 is explaining that it's entirely by God's grace. If it is be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. I mean, nothing could be clearer. And he says, what then? Israel 
hath not obtained that which he seeketh, okay, or seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So here's the important thing. Israel, of their own free will, seek God, okay, but they haven't obtained him. They have not obtained salvation. They sought it by their own free will. That's what it says in verse 7. But the election, those who didn't seek after God, okay, there they, okay, they found salvation. They obtained it. The rest were blinded. That is, God has blinded those who are by their own will trying to find him. He says, God had given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear unto this day. I mean, this is the theme of the Bible. Uh, in verse 9, and David saith, we're talking uh, chapter 11, verse 9, and David saith, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened uh, that they may uh, not see and bow down their back always. He's talking about those who seek God of their own free will. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? They, they. Now, this is interesting, okay? When he's talking about they, he's, he says, God forbid. Rather, through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So through the fall of the, of the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles. But understand this, that it, it, the, when we are grafted in as Gentiles into the vine, okay, we are the, we are the branches which are against nature being, being grafted in. God is illustrating by that point that, listen, this vine, okay, is not just Jews. It's Jews and Gentiles, okay? And they were broken off. Why? He says in verse 20, because of unbelief, they were broken off, okay? And that we were grafted in, how? By faith. We stand by faith, see? And what he's saying is don't boast against those branches that they were broken off and now you're grafted in. Don't, don't say, hey, I'm a Gentile. I'm so wonderful, okay? God's saying, listen, um, as he did not spare them, Okay, he won't spare those who claim some special status as a Gentile. See, it's all by his grace. That's the whole theme of it. And he says in verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved. See, Israel is a spiritual kingdom. It's a spiritual people made up of both Jews and Gentiles. Okay, back to you. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to read here, go to Galatians again. And it says, um, verse 25 of chapter 3, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. For there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I just kind of thought that went along well with that part in uh, Romans you were just reading. You can get, yes. Yeah, excellent point. Amen. Yeah, great points by both of you, brothers. Um, Yeah, uh, you know, as we say many times uh, here in fellowship together, you know, these false these false teachers like Service Christi here, they're not hard to dispute. All we have to do by the grace of God is go to scripture and salvation by grace through faith is the entire theme of the Bible. Just like brother Ed said a few minutes ago. All right. We see the grace of God in the very opening chapters of scripture. We see it directly. All right. In the life of Noah, it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then we go on to read in, in, in the next verse that Noah was a righteous man. All right. And the reason that he was was because he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. All right. And salvation by grace through faith is the entire. All right. It says it says in verse eight and verse nine, of Genesis six. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man. All right. And perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. The reason that, that, that Noah was just, all right, and the reason that he walked with God 
was because he was a recipient of the grace of God. And Noah was given the faith of Christ to build that ark and to trust that he would be turned, that he would be safe and secure, him and everything that God had placed inside that ark. Very clearly, very clearly the teaching of scripture. And once again, and I'll turn it back over to you guys to to uh to close the broad to close the broadcast out tonight. I just want to say once again, Ephesians chapter two, verse eight and nine. For by grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The minute that you come into Holy Scripture and say that this faith somehow resides with you of your own so-called autonomous free will, and you can choose to exercise it or not, you have not made it. You have took it from being a gift of God and made it the work of your own hands. Whether you want to admit it or not, that's what you've done, and you have defiled it. You have attempted to put your hands to the finished work of Jesus Christ, and God will kill you for it. Make no mistake about it. We are saved by grace, through faith, and that none of ourselves. It is the gift of God, the grace, the salvation, and the faith. And without turn it over to you guys. Yeah, your point with regard to Noah, that is such a great point um, in Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That is such an amazing passage, and it does completely explain uh, Noah's election. Back to you. I would encourage I would encourage anyone who is interested in hearing, you know, how faith really comes from God. As Brother Carl mentioned earlier, Hebrews chapter 11 teaches us this. You, you can go through here and you read about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham. All these people had faith, but where did it come from? It, come, it came from God. Verse 6 here of Hebrews chapter 11 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I'm not trying to take verses out of context, because if you go read a whole chapter 11, or whole chapter 11 Hebrews there, you see that. But if you jump over here to John chapter 6, and you read verses 45 through 47, it is written in the prophets, and they shall, all, shall be all thought of God. And every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father come unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. We see, we're taught clearly that to even believe in Christ, we have to be taught of God, who he is. Just like it says here in Hebrews, without faith it's impossible to please him, for he that believeth must, that cometh to God must believe that he is. And in order to believe in Christ and have that saving faith that's of Christ, we have to get, that's from the Holy Spirit itself. None of us will do that apart from the quickening power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Faith is, is God's work, not ours. When it says, you know, if you have the faith, you can move a mountain. Well, he, he kept saying to these people, oh, ye of little faith. They didn't have any faith. It all comes from Jesus Christ. It's his work. And all these people that it talks about in Hebrews chapter 11, if you go back and read each one of those stories, all of it started with God going to these people. These people didn't go seek God. The Lord came to them and said, hey, I'm going to bless you with many people. Hey, you're going to have a child. Hey, you're going to have this future uh, Jerusalem up here. It didn't start with them going, you know what? I think I'm, I'm a really old lady, and I want to have a baby, so I'm going to well up enough faith in me that I can you know, go out and have a baby. No, Sarah laughed. That was her faith. She didn't think she could do it. It was a work of the Lord. And I want to make that perfectly clear, folks, that and anyone fighting against it, this is a blessing from God. The faith comes from God. It's not of ourselves. We should rejoice in that fact that we have it from God and not try to turn it back on ourselves. We're being taught of God when we have true faith in Jesus Christ. It's a blessing, and we shouldn't try to fight against that, people. I don't understand why anyone wants to. Go ahead. Hey, Amen. Hey, that was yeah, such a great point, Aaron. Let me ask you a question. I missed the passage you were referring to early on. I apologize. Um, where you made the point that faith is, is brought to us uh, uh, by God, and w where was that passage? I it's in that. John chapter John chapter six, verses four, verse forty five. It says, you know, and they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Yeah, wow, it's amazing how many times I've read that, and I I missed the uh, that aspect of it. Yeah, that's a really good point. You may be the children of your father. Wait, oh, here we go. Wow, that is wait six. Uh, you said oh, I'm 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 in Matthew. Sorry, 
Yeah. And, and by the way, um, regarding what Carl said with regard to Noah, you know, if you look in, in uh, again, I'm building on what Aaron said, because as you're going through this, I'm looking through these passages in, um, in verse seven, it talks about by faith, Noah being warned of God. And then it says that he became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. Well, isn't that interesting? So you talked about him being uh, righteous. Well, it was by faith. His righteousness That's right. was by faith. There you go. That's interesting. Amen. And God, and went, to, God went to Noah. <laughs> right. First. And that's, and you know, he found grace and truly we all do. And something that I was, you know, verse 28 here, since, you know, since we're here, I just want to make this comment about verse 29. Excuse me. This is absolutely such a perfect picture of works and grace, right? It says by faith, they pass through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do or drown. God give the Israelites faith to pass through these waters. That's why they were able to pass through because God, because they were recipients of grace and God gave them faith to do so. When the Egyptians tried to do it on their own, of their own so-called free will, works of their own hands, what happened? God killed them for it. <laughs> A perfect picture of works and grace. I mean, this whole, he, this whole 11th chapter of Hebrews is very clearly teaching us that faith is the gift of Almighty God, and what an awesome picture of works and grace that we have that, that that we have there in verse twenty nine. And I really enjoyed the fellowship with you guys tonight. Yeah, Amen. that's really a, that's really a good point. So it's almost like the uh, the Arminians are like the um, uh, the army of Pharaoh. Yes, they are. <laughs> They're the Egyptians. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it's the whole theme of scripture, brothers. And why would people, why, why do people want to, I guess we know the answer. It's the devil. I mean, it's, it's absolutely evil to, you know, to, to attack the word of God like they do. Yeah, it surely is. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Yep. It was good talking with you gentlemen. That was excellent. Hey, I appreciate it. All right, brother Aaron. God bless you and your family, and brother Ed. You guys too. Um, and I sure did enjoy the fellowship. God okay, you take care, you guys. All right, you guys too. Talk to you, right, talk to you later. Bye. All right.